Hello, I'm John De Niro. I've been teaching in the EECS department for several years, starting in 2011. But actually, I was a graduate student here before. So I started teaching here as a teaching assistant back in 2005. And nowadays, mostly I teach introductory level courses. I regularly teach the first course for majors in computer science, which here is numbered 61A. I'll tell you a little bit more about it soon. And I also help develop and sometimes teach our introductory data science course called Data 8. And then I teach a variety of other things, artificial intelligence, data science techniques. And at the moment, I'm co-teaching a graduate course on my research area, which is called natural language processing. That's the subfield of computer science that tries to get computers to do useful things with natural languages like English and Spanish and Chinese. And a lot of my research focuses on what's called machine translation, which is getting computers to automatically translate from one human language to another. And I'm especially interested in how people, and in particular professional translators, interact with artificial intelligence systems in order to get things done either faster or more effectively with the aid of machines. And I also have a bit of an administrative role as the vice chair for undergraduate matters in the EECS department, which just means that I help guide the process of figuring out what our degree requirements are and how to fold in new courses that we develop along the way. And one of the fun parts of that gig is that I get to tell you about our program. So thanks so much for tuning in. I'm actually going to talk for a while because there's a lot to know about computer science at Berkeley. And it would be even better if I were standing in front of you and you could ask me questions as we go. But we unfortunately don't have that luxury. So I'll do my best to anticipate what questions you might have and kind of answer them along the way. And if you have further questions, I'll give you some pointers at the end about how to ask them. Okay, so let's dive in. We actually have two different undergraduate programs that are housed in two colleges. So UC Berkeley is one campus with many colleges. What does that mean? It just means there are different ways that an undergrad can apply into the university. But whether you apply through the College of Engineering or the College of Letters and Sciences, it's possible to major with our department. One of these programs is called EECS. The other one is called CS. But they're essentially the same. Aside from some tiny variations, the requirements of these two majors having to do with our department are identical. Now, because they're in different colleges, they have different breadth requirements. EEC students have to take physics, CS students don't, but the courses that you take with us are the same. And both of these programs offer a lot of flexibility. So whether you major in EECS or whether you major in CS, you can focus more in computer science, you can focus more in electrical engineering, or you can mix the two together, which is, I think, what most students do. They take some of each, depending on where their interests lead them, because so much of what's going on in the world today lies at the intersection of these two disciplines, which at Berkeley are all housed in one department. And that means the lines between electrical engineering and computer science here are very blurry, and that's a wonderful thing. So whether you're a CS or an EECS major, you take a broad lower division that consists of a three-course series in computing called CS 61A, B, and C, a course in discrete mathematics, that's the branch of mathematics that has most relevance to computer science. It's called CS70. And then a two-semester sequence that covers another important branch of mathematics called linear algebra, as well as fundamental ideas in electrical engineering, like how circuits work, how signal processing is done, and how you build stuff. In fact, the final project in this two-course series is to build a robot car that responds to your voice commands. It's pretty cool. Once you've completed the lower division, and everybody has to do the whole thing, then you get to pick where the major takes you next. We have a broad array of upper division courses. Typically, you have to finish most or all of the lower division in order to take one of these upper division courses, so you kind of know what you're doing. And that means that the upper division can courses can go very deep into a particular topic area. You can learn lots about databases or security or theory, or electric power systems, whatever captures your interest. And each of these courses aligns to a research group 
within the department and is typically taught by the faculty in that research group, which tend to be world experts in that subject. And some of those faculty also teach the lower division, so you can certainly get to know faculty in your early courses. But if you want to learn about a particular topic, that usually happens in the upper division. And the basic structure is that you take the lower division, then you pick five upper division courses, and that's the coursework that you complete within the department. Then you need to pick some technical electives. They can either be in or out of the department, and then you graduate. There are also some additional breadth requirements for LNS computer science. I'll let you read about all of those, and I'll just kind of focus on the stuff that's run by our department. So let me say a little bit more about the lower division. The most typical combination is that people will take 61A and x 16A at the same time. 61A teaches you about programming languages and how computers run programs. And the goal there is to build up your capacity for solving problems using programs. It's known as quite a fast paced course that covers quite a bit more content than a typical intro course. And most students that take it do have prior programming experience, either in high school or because they've taken other courses here beforehand. And the most typical choices of courses that people take before 61A are a course called CS10, The Beauty and Joy of Computing, which is an introduction for non-majors, but also a nice way to ramp up into the major track. And also our new Foundations of Data Science course called Data 8, which introduces programming at a somewhat more reasonable place than 61A. Because 61A was built for students who mostly have prior experience or are willing to dedicate a lot of time to the course. And it's very common that right after people take 61A, they take 61B, a second course in programming and computer science that focuses on data structures and algorithms. So what does that mean? Well, 61A is more about solving any problem that comes along, whereas 61B focuses on particular problems or classes of problems that arise often, like sorting a list or keeping track of how many different values are in a big collection and learning the very best way of solving those problems so that by the end of these two courses, you can solve any problem. If you see a problem that lots of people have solved before, you know how to do it from the 61B material. And if you see something brand new, well, you can probably tackle that too. And these courses have a lot of programming projects. The ones in 61A are quite structured. They give you a roadmap for how to solve the problem, but you have to solve all the pieces. And then in 61B, the guardrails come off and it's up to you to design the whole program, constructing all the pieces and also figuring out how they fit together. And CS70 is a discrete math and probability theory course, which are the two branches of mathematics that are most relevant to computing. And you don't have to take it after 61A and 61B, but you should take some mathematics courses beforehand. The prerequisite for CS70 is sophomore level mathematical maturity, which means you should be taking some math in your freshman year and then take 70 in your sophomore year. Some students take it at the end of their freshman year. And that's fine too, as long as you have a strong math background already. And probably the best way to prepare for CS70 is to take the EEC 16A and 16B series. So I'll jump ahead and talk about those. These are mathematically oriented classes. A large part of them is learning a branch of mathematics called linear algebra which is used in lots of different areas of computing and electrical engineering, from signal processing to machine learning and artificial intelligence to graphics and beyond. But learning linear algebra just as pure math can leave students wondering, what's the point? So in our course series, we teach you the linear algebra along with applications in electrical engineering where the mathematical techniques are used. So you learn the math and you learn how to apply it to analyze circuits and signals, etc. And after two courses of that, you'll not only learn linear algebra well, but you'll learn about what it's like to take a college level math course where you don't just perform computation, but you also prove things. And there's lots more of that to come in CS70. So the most common path is to take 16A and then 16B and then take 70 in your sophomore year. But sometimes people mix it up. In order to declare the computer science major in the College of Letters and Sciences, you have to take 61A, 61B, and 70, those three courses at the top, and you do have to have a high GPA 
across those three courses of 3.3 or above, where 3.3 is the numerical value for a B+. Why a B+. Well, it turns out that there's just a tremendous amount of student demand for courses in the East Department. And unfortunately, we don't have enough course capacity to accommodate everybody who wants to study this topic. And it's not for lack of trying. We've increased the course capacity in our upper division computer science courses by more than three times over the last decade. And we're still growing them as fast as we can. But the amount of student demand increased even faster. So we're in the unfortunate position where, even though we educate lots and lots of students, we have to turn some away from our upper division courses. And the way we do that is by limiting the set of people who can declare the computer science major and then giving enrollment priority in upper division courses only to computer science and East majors. The lower division courses actually have a lot of enrollment capacity. And so as long as you sign up early enough, you could take any of these courses, regardless of whether you're a declared major or not. It's the upper division courses that are harder to get into. So you don't have to worry about 61A filling up and you're not being able to take it. But if you do want to major in computer science, then you do have to worry about your grades in 61A, 61B, and 70, because those are the grades that will determine whether you get to declare computer science or not. Now, I think more than half of students who are intent on majoring in computer science manage to meet that threshold. There are lots of students that meet the threshold but decide they want to major in something else along the way. And there are students that want to major in computer science but don't meet the threshold. And what happens to them? Well, there's lots of other interesting stuff to major in here at Berkeley. And I personally think the courses you take matter more than the major that you end up fulfilling. So I don't think you need to have too much stress over whether you declare computer science or not. And if your goal is to study something like computer science, well, there are great options there, including the data science major, the cognitive science major, the applied math major, or you could take some computer science courses, but major in something else. That's very common. And students who do that take a bunch of courses in another area, but they can still learn some computer science by taking the lower division courses. Okay, and then there's 61C, and that's where it all comes together. So in 61A and B, you've learned about how programs are written, and how they work. In EEC 16A and 16B, you've learned about circuits and how to analyze them. But how does a computer actually run a program? Well, that involves circuits. And 61C is the course that describes that connection. How it is that machines are structured in order to execute the programs that people write in order to get things done. And at Berkeley, we believe that everybody should have this perspective of knowing not only how to program a computer, but also how it works. That's important life knowledge, and it also makes you a better programmer. And what if you want to just focus on the machine structure slide? How come you have to learn about programming? Well, I think it is important if you're building machines to understand how people are going to use them. So that's why everybody takes the whole lower division sequence. And what about the upper division? Well, I'm not going to read the list of all the different courses, and this is just a subset. And we're adding new ones all the time. We hired a world expert in cryptography, and now we have an upper division undergraduate course in cryptography. That's one of the most modern and well-taught versions of such a course anywhere on the planet. And same goes for many other fields. But the basic story is that when you've taken the lower division, now you have an idea of what the field of electrical engineering and computer science is all about, and you could pick which topics within it are most relevant to what you want to do with it later, or which seem most interesting to you. You pick at least five from the EECS department. You have to do 27 units in total. Each course is usually four units. And there are people who do all 27 units in the EECS department. But in general, it's better to have some variety in what you learn while you're in college. So you can take technical electives from business or economics or math or art or a wide range of other disciplines in order to complement what you're learning from the EECS department. So that's the structure of the major. Take the lower division, take 27 units of the upper division coursework, make sure you fulfill all your college level breadth requirements, and you made it. A lot of the buildings that were built for this department are used for instructional purposes. So we have a variety of different instructional laboratories in these buildings that are used as part of courses 
and are also available for students if they want to do various kinds of independent projects. So some of them are just filled with computers and some of them are filled with other kinds of equipment so that you can write programs and you can build stuff. And we have a lot of space that's dedicated toward project-based assignments where students and professors can gather together to talk about their projects, work on something together, and create things that I think are hard to create anywhere else besides Berkeley. We also have some space that's just dedicated to studying so that students can drop in and either work together or by themselves and they don't get stuck in their dorms. There's space like this all over campus, in the libraries, for example, but it's nice to have some that's dedicated to students studying computer science and electrical engineering, because then you run into people studying similar stuff and you might end up working together. Here are a few metrics. Our retention rate is very high. Most students who come here stay here. Our average time to degree is a little less than four years. It's certainly possible to finish the computer science major in less than four years. One way to really accelerate things is to take summer courses, but you certainly don't need to take summer courses in order to finish in four or three and a half years. My personal recommendation is to stay for four years if you can, because Berkeley is a great place. I mean, the reason I teach here is that Berkeley is my favorite place. You might find it's your favorite place too, so why leave early? But there are reasons that people decide to leave early because they're ready to go do something else, and that's a possibility too. Graduating seniors in LMS computer science have a high average grade point average. It tends to be a group of very high achieving students. And in fact, a quarter of them have more than one major. You don't need multiple majors. You can be a very high achieving student just majoring in one thing. But if you want to major in two things, that's a possibility here at Berkeley. And whether you major in one thing or more, it is a good idea to take courses from multiple different departments in order to get some variety in your academic plan. Okay, here's a little bit about our culture. Our courses are generally taught by regular faculty members. Almost all of our faculty are research-oriented faculty that run large research labs. They mentor graduate students, but they also teach undergrads. And one thing that has surprised and delighted me the most about teaching here at Berkeley is that the EECS faculty are amazingly dedicated to undergraduate education. They care a lot about it. They care about the courses they teach and they want our students to have a good experience and learn a lot, which is not true everywhere. You know, professors are generally hired to do great research, and at some places teaching can be kind of an afterthought, but here in the Berkeley East Department, that's not the case. We have awards that we give to professors if they do a good job teaching, but I think that's not why they care about teaching. They don't do it for the awards. They do it because they care. But we've had some nice recognition from the campus which gives out an award each year for excellence in teaching. And there are lots of different departments here, so these awards get spread around, but a fair number of them have come our way. So here are the faculty members currently teaching in the department who have won the Distinguished Teaching Award. Our department is growing, and we have had amazing success in the last few years, picking the very best people in the world that we want to join our faculty, making them an offer to come, and having them accept which is great because while other universities are having the opposite problem, their faculty are leaving for industry, in some cases they're actually shrinking, Berkeley Eeks is growing and it's growing with the best possible people. So this might just look like a picture of a bunch of faces, but these are some of the top scholars in the world in electrical engineering and computer science. Some are coming from other universities, some are coming straight out of their PhD, but in all these cases, we basically had our pick of who we wanted and they decided to come, even though they had offers from some other top schools. And this is helping us grow the number of courses that we offer, offer our courses more regularly, and that means that even though the number of people wanting to study computer science and electrical engineering here continues to increase, we're making some good progress in keeping up with that demand by expanding our course offerings and other parts of our academic program. We also have three new faculty members joining in 2020, and they're fantastic too. I can't wait to work with them. And so if you end up at Berkeley, then you'll know you're joining a place where we have both senior faculty who have won tons of awards, and also more junior faculty just joining, who are the folks leading the most promising research agendas in electrical engineering and computer science from anywhere in the world. We try to foster a lot of faculty-student interaction, 
Faculty hold office hours, and you can just show up in their office and talk to them about whatever you want. There's faculty advising, where if you want advice on what courses to take, what internships to look for, what graduate schools to apply to, what to do with your time, whether it's okay to take a semester off because you want to work on an independent project, any advice like this, the faculty will be happy to give you their opinion. Now, they're just opinions, but we've worked with a lot of students. And we've had some interesting paths through life. So I do recommend that instead of making decisions just by reading stuff on the internet, you take the time to go to advising sessions or office hours and get a faculty member's take on anything important that you're thinking about. We have some faculty student lunches and undergraduate social hours, and the faculty are only one part of the East Department. We also have an incredibly talented and dedicated and wonderful staff that run the administrative, advising, and organizational aspects of our undergraduate program. So this slide includes pictures of some of my favorite people in the world. The team that we've assembled here is full of folks that are really good at their jobs, people who really care a lot about you and what's happening in your life, and work really hard to make our department thrive. And, you know, as a result of them doing a good job, lots of people want to major in computer science and eeks, so we have a lot of students to work with, but they're the ones that really make it work even at our large scale. And there's more. There's access to tutoring, advising, mentoring. There's a tremendous culture here of peer learning and peer mentoring. So what does that mean? That means people that took a course will often get involved in teaching that course in the subsequent years that they're here. And that means that even in a large course, you can get an individualized experience because lots of people are involved in teaching the course not just the instructor. Last fall, I taught CS61A. It was the largest course on campus. More than 2,000 students were trying to enroll at the beginning. We let them all in. Some of them decided to take other stuff because it's not uncommon that people discover there's an even better course for them in the first couple of weeks. So we had a little less than 2,000 by the end of the term. And I had over 100 students on my course staff. 60 TAs, 40 some tutors, all dedicated to helping those 2,000 students learn all they could during the course. So even though the course might be very large, because we have a strong peer teaching community, we have lots of small sections, small tutorial groups, and even individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring available if you want it. Students don't just take classes. They often get involved in student organizations. If this were a live presentation, then I'd have each one of these groups come up and tell you a little bit about themselves. But I'm in my house right now, and these student clubs are not meeting in my house. So they can't come tell you about themselves, but they do really wonderful things. Engaging with the community, building cool stuff, and in some cases, expanding Berkeley's educational mission beyond the borders of the campus and out into the rest of the world. And joining one of these student organizations is not necessary, but it can be a wonderful part of the undergraduate experience here if you find an organization that fits well with your interests and new student organizations pop up every year. So if there isn't one that's exactly what you want, you could start your own. And since there are lots of people studying electrical engineering and computer science here, chances are, if you're excited about something, you can find other people excited about it too, and then you have your own student organization. There's a strong entrepreneurial spirit here at Berkeley. Each faculty and alumni have founded more than 100 startups. Some of these startups are already huge. Some of them are on their way to becoming huge. And our community is starting new companies all the time that often attract large investments from venture capitalists. We have special programs that support new ventures. For example, there's this Bacar Fellows program, which is about helping early faculty commercialize some of their discoveries. And we've had several people from the department be chosen as fellows for that program. And we have a similar program to mentor current students. So entrepreneurship is something that spans everywhere from our undergraduate program to our graduate program to faculty research. We have a one-year incubator program for startups, which gives you access to the invention lab that we have, along with mentorship and collaborative workspaces. And it lets you help build prototypes of whatever it is that you want to bring to market. And we have a new institute for design innovation called Jacobs Hall that's filled with collaborative classrooms in the top two levels. And in the basement, it's filled with equipment for building stuff. 3D printers, rapid prototyping tools, 
and more. The lead gift for creating this was given by Paul Jacobs, the chairman and CEO from Qualcomm, an alumnus of our program, who said, Today is not enough to provide our future engineering leaders with technical skills. They must also learn how to work in interdisciplinary teams, how to iterate designs rapidly, how to manufacture sustainably, how to combine art and engineering, and how to address global markets. Well, I couldn't agree more, and now we have a great space to do it in. And there was like a recent survey of all undergraduates about what their favorite building on campus was. And I think this was at or near the top of the list. It's really a nice new space, and we hold many of our design-oriented classes inside of it. So what's next? We have courses for you to take. That's how you get going. There are many undergraduate research opportunities available. You can apply to them in your first year if you want. Most people wait and do research in their third or fourth year once they have a strong background in coursework and they know really what they want to focus on. Many companies will come to campus trying to recruit students for internships and full-time jobs. So you don't even have to leave campus in order to look for an internship. They'll come to you. And here's some logos. But this is just like a small fraction of all the companies that come to our internship fair or come to make presentations on campus. And here's some more folks. So since Berkeley is right in the middle of the San Francisco Bay Area, where a lot of technology is developed, there's plenty of opportunity to get involved in that if you want, either while you're a student or shortly after graduating. And what can else can I tell you? Uh, there's an honors program. This is something that you apply to in your third or fourth year and lets you pursue an academic concentration outside of EECS. And there's a fifth year master's degree program. So if you've started research as an undergrad and you want to spend a fifth year at Berkeley finishing up that research and getting a master's degree, you can apply to that. It is just for students who have had a strong GPA and have an existing research project that they'd like to finish up. But the fact that you can get a master's degree in one year instead of two is very appealing to some students. And once you get your degree, what can you do? We could go to graduate school in lots of different disciplines. You can go to work. Tech companies would love to hire you. Biotechnology as well. You could join a consulting firm. You could start your own company. People do all kinds of stuff. We have a very high average starting salary for LNSCS graduates. And this is the average. Some people make more, some people make less, but that's just their first year out. It's certainly the case that what you learn here can serve you well in a lifelong career where you can participate in all the change that's happening in the world due to technology. Berkeley CS alums have a strong reputation out there in the world. We're known as self-starters. We graduate with street smarts, not just academic knowledge, but we're also known as being very good technically because we have a rigorous program. We bring in great people. They learn a lot while they're here, and then they go out and apply that knowledge in the world. So here are some quotes that people have collected over time. But being successful in the world is not just about being technically proficient or really smart. You also have to be able to work with others. You learn that here. And you have to be able to work with integrity and honesty. And that can start here at Berkeley as well. We have an honor code at UC Berkeley where we all declare that as members of the UC Berkeley community, we act with honesty, integrity, and respect for others. And learning that discipline while you're a student sets you up to be productive in the world afterwards. So, in summary, the Berkeley EECS department, which runs the computer science major in the letters and sciences, as well as the EECS major in the College of Engineering, is vibrant, it's a dynamic community, it's full of all kinds of people with all kinds of interests who share a common motivation for understanding and using this technology, and it's really just a wonderful group of folks. We're leaders in research, and that lets us build a really great undergraduate curriculum where you can learn a lot from the people who discovered many of these ideas in the first place. And our undergraduate program is designed to be flexible. You got this fixed lower division that everybody takes in order to have a solid foundation, but then the structure of the program is really up to you to shape by picking the courses that you care about, finding research opportunities, participating in student groups, helping teach courses, whatever it is that matters to you. And you won't do it alone. We have lots of opportunities for teamwork and collaboration, so that you can take advantage of working with all the other wonderful people that come here. I hope that gives you some idea of what it's like around here. I know it's not the same as coming to campus, but hopefully it's better than nothing. And when you do in fact come to campus sometime in the future, I look forward to meeting you then. If you have further questions, the easiest way to get them answered is to email cs-advising at cs.berkeley.edu or to make an appointment with an advisor. Okay, have a good day. I hope you're well out there.
Take care and go Bears.